Welcome back warriors. My name is Pam Palmiter and this is my YouTube channel where we focus on educating the resistance and inspiring the next generation of warriors to help us protect the people and the planet. Now today's episode is a very special one. It's one that's being done by request. It's a special presentation that I have been doing for First Nations chiefs and First Nations organizations all across the country who want to have some kind of analysis and insight in to the federal government's legislative rights framework agenda that we've really received very little information about and people are generally wondering how is this going to impact our rights? Is it going to make our lives better or is it going to make it worse? And throughout this presentation I plan on giving you some of those answers as well as some advice on where do we go from here. And before we do that though I think it's very important to state that you know all First Nations should get their own independent legal advice because even though I've been a lawyer for 20 years and I used to be legal counsel with Justice Canada and Indian Affairs, it's always important to get your own independent legal advice. The other thing I would say about this is that we're going to talk a little bit about the historical context because the one thing that I have found in talking to First Nations all across the country is that we need some kind of legal and political context in which to put this framework work so that we can ask and answer the basic question where are we in this? Is this a better proposal than governments have ever given to us before? Is this different in any way? If not, why not? And is this in our best interests? And so this analysis that I'm offering is just for your consideration. I'm not telling First Nations what to do or how to do it, but I am really urging some very, very uh, strong cautions and considerations around uh, accepting this kind of federal legislative proposal. So the first thing I do is actually take us through a very brief historical context. What has Canada's Indian policy been for First Nations and what has been the impact on us in terms of our daily lives? And one of the first things I think that's important to know is that there was a whole host of European policy analysts and thinkers that were having a, a really huge influence on what was happening uh, here in Canada with colonial governments. And one of those thinkers was Herman uh, Merivale. And in 1841, he came up with a, essentially a four-point plan for what he called the Indian problem. What are we going to do with the fact that we're trying to take the rest of the lands and resources in this country, uh, but we signed treaties with First Nations, so legally we can't do that. So his four-point plan started very uh, directly with an extermination plan. His plan was either to kill off all Indians or enfranchise them so they weren't legally Indians anymore. And I mean, that's a very direct and purposeful kind of policy agenda. The second part of his plan was to focus on slavery. Maybe if we can't exterminate them all, we can use the rest of them for slavery, basically free labor, like was what was already happening to the uh, people who had uh, been imported from the African continent who were being used as slaves in Canada and the US. The other part of his plan was to focus on segregation. So really dividing up our First Nations into smaller communities so that we wouldn't have the power of our nations and then put us on reserves and make it illegal for us to leave reserves, that kind of segregation. And then his fourth plan was for anybody who's left over, the core legal and policy focus would really be to assimilate the rest of Indians into um, the colonial population, which ended up becoming the Canadian population. So you have to think about Indian policy as it's viewed by the federal government from that context. That was how it actually started out. Now, you go to, uh, you know, several years several years later and there's various commissions and inquiries about what do we do about Indian affairs and one of them was the Bagot Commission in 1944 and in that commission uh, they talked very directly about residential schools plan because what they wanted to do to help speed up assimilation was take Indigenous kids from their parents and their communities and put them into residential schools where they would, you know, be forced to abandon their culture and language and ultimately their connections to their nations. And the other thing about the Bagot Commission was that 
um, the idea was to centralize Indian affairs because remember in the 17 and 1800s you have different colonial officials over different parts of Canada with little bits and pieces of legislation trying to control uh, First Nations and what they were doing and what they wanted to do was centralize that kind of process. And the other thing which was which is really interesting because there are some people who think that this is only a recent phenomenon but they even back Back then they said one of the best ways to get rid of you know these collective powerful nations was to do away with traditional forms of governance but the best way to kind of interrupt that kind of communal collective uh, sense of identity was to force this concept of individual property ownership. So owning lands as individuals and fee simple apart from the territory and also this whole concept of free enterprise and materialism. So they really hoped that this idea of individual land ownership, free enterprise would be the end of First Nations as collectives and that was you know, some of the core recommendations from the Bagot Commission. The other thing, of course, was to discontinue treaty payments. I mean, we all know that our treaties that we've signed with um, the British Crown have been honored more in the breach than in the actual practice or implementation. But their intentions to not follow the treaties stems back way to the 1800s. And so after that commission, you have something called the Penfather Commission, and that was in 1858. And they had the same kind of recommendations, but they were a little bit more direct. Let's just get rid of their traditional forms of government. Let's assimilate so-called Indians into society and just abolish Indian affairs altogether so we don't have to worry about this Indian problem anymore. So this was the mentality very, very early days, even after signing treaties where we were supposed to live in peace and friendship and respect each other's sovereignty and forms of government, uh, the colonial governments had a very different idea. So it wasn't shortly, you know, it wasn't so long after that that we have, of course, the Indian Act. And that was enacted in 1876, and it has been fundamentally the same act ever since. Now, while there's been uh, amendments, there hasn't been a fundamental shift away from what the target was. And the target was really the centralized authority, the Minister of Indian Affairs, who controlled everything uh, in, an, in an Indian's life, and that's the terminology they use in the Indian Act, from essentially birth until death, all powers uh, rested in the Minister of Indian Affairs, and all accountability uh, went exactly from the you know, Indian Act form of chief and council governments back to the minister. There was never any form of accountability to the actual communities themselves. And so this act has had a tremendous impact on our lives. Uh, because of the authority that it gives the minister. But we can't actually overstate what the Indian Act has done, because remember, it's a piece of paper. The Act doesn't actually do anything. It's the minister and all of those uh, to whom he or she delegates their power, those are the ones who are exercising their dis discretion and their powers to determine what happens in our lives. So really the greatest harm has actually come from all of the officials that have ever worked at Indian Affairs. Now we all know that the Indian Act controls who's an Indian, who can be a member of a First Nation, what kinds of governments they have, what kinds of elections they have, and what kinds of powers they have. And the powers are actually pretty minimal under the Indian Act. You're talking about controlling noxious weeds and beekeeping and, and cattle, tre cattle trespass, as opposed to the real sovereign powers uh, that are inherent and pre-existing in First Nations. Now, if you go from, you know, the early thinkers and the early commissions, which is really focused on, you know, controlling First Nations and, and assimilating them, if not outright killing them, uh, to the Indian Act, then you have, you know, you move forward to 1969, and the 1969 white paper is something that most people are really familiar with uh, who have worked in First Nation politics at all. It's essentially the former Prime Minister, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, and the former Minister of Indian Affairs, Jean Chrétien, had actually uh, wanted to change Indian Affairs. And what they did, actually, was they actually engaged with First Nations all across the country 
about, you know, what do you want from us? How do you see the relationship? And, you know, First Nations uh, leaders and councils and community members from across the country said, you know, the core things are you have to respect our sovereignty, you have to respect our treaty rights, uh, we want some of our lands and resources back, and, you know, you know kind of like the core things that First Nations have been saying literally for decades and decades. Well, after those uh, engagement sessions, we had something called the 1969 White Paper, where uh, former Prime Minister Trudeau uh, said, here's my vision for Canada. And it was, it couldn't have been actually more opposite than what First Nations said in the very beginning. You have a scenario where they're saying, we don't want any more Indian affairs. In fact, we don't want any more Indians. We don't want any more reserves. Our uh, approach is that you would just assimilate into the body politic, you know, into society. And uh, by the way, there would be no more treaties or treaty rights or we wouldn't have to worry about the land question. And as the little tiny carrot that they offered for that was that, well here, we'll offer you a little bit of ECDEV money. And their idea of economic development is a little bit of money to do crafts and artwork and basket weaving, not the kind of economic development that we have been involved in from time immemorial as strong sovereign nations on this territory, we're talking about little tiny things um, that are very much focused on, on arts and crafts and nothing that would fundamentally or substantively su sustain our nations. And the reason for that is because they didn't want us to be nations anymore. They wanted the provinces to have jurisdiction over us. So in essence, that was the core aspect of, of the uh, 1969 white paper. But First Nations didn't just stand idly by about that. The First Nation response was very quick. They felt terribly betrayed by what the Prime Minister had done. So they um, issued something called the Red Paper. That's what it ended up being named, but it was written by Harold Cardinal um, from the um, First Nations in Alberta, and it was a direct response to the White Paper. And they said, in fact, here's our position. You're not getting rid of the Indian Act. You're not getting rid of reserves. You're not getting rid of our tax exemptions. We will not be under provincial jurisdiction. And you will uh, protect in all of your laws and policies our special and unique legal and political and cultural identity as Indians. You will protect our Aboriginal and treaty rights, our land rights. And it was a very, very pointed response to the 1969 white paper, which I think is very important because throughout history, you often hear about, you know, how Canada implemented this or forced this onto First Nations, but you don't always hear about how we resisted. And this was something that was adopted by First Nations all across the country. But at the same time, it is important to know that uh, other organizations like the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood, which is now known as the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, they also wrote their own response and in a very different style. And their response was called Wabung, Our Tomorrows. And they were saying essentially the same thing. No, you're not getting rid of the Indian Act. You're not getting rid of our tax exemptions or our reserves or our treaty rights. You're not getting rid of our reserve land holdings. Both the you know red paper and Wabung, their core message is you can't do anything in relation to us without our consent. And I think that was consistent all the way through, that yeah, none of us really like the Indian Act, it's been very problematic in terms of how it's been implemented, but there's no way that you're going to repeal or amend the Indian Act, which impacts our lives from birth to death, unless and until you have our consent. And our consent fundamentally means whatever it means for First Nations. So. You might have to get consent from a treaty area. You might have to get consent from the whole Mi'kmaq nation, or you might have to go first nation by first nation. And that's up to us to decide. And so Wabung was very, very powerful. It gave the same messages and of course said things like, we're not gonna go under provincial jurisdiction. That's the worst thing that could happen to our people. And um, those messages came across really loud, really strong. And as a result, you had the prime minister who was really thrown back on his heels because he thought he could convince 
First Nations and the Canadian public that his idea of equality was sameness. If everyone was the exact same, the exact la same language and culture, then that's what equality was. And for First Nations, equality meant no, it's recognizing our difference and celebrating that difference. So faced with this huge backlash and protests from literally all across the country, Prime Minister Trudeau and uh, Minister Jean Chrétien said, okay, 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 we're sorry. You know, this was, uh, this didn't work out. We're not going to impose the 1969 white paper policy. You know, the government is just going to throw that in the garbage and we'll start over. But that's where, just like with broken treaties, that's where the lies started to pile up. Because in fact, they told us they were abandoning the 1969 white paper, but in fact, they didn't. If you look at the actual correspondence in the minister's office from the ADM to the ministers and the prime minister, they said, hey, listen, there's actually no reason to abandon the white paper. What we're gonna do is we're actually gonna break it up into tiny little parts and implement it as tiny individual policy initiatives so that the First Nations chiefs won't know what we're doing. And that is, not only was it untruthful and deceptive, but that's exactly how the government has been acting ever since. And this government is really no exception. And I still, so I think it's really important in understanding what's happening today to know what they were planning uh, way back then. Now, if you move forward from the 1969 white paper, which they said they abandoned, but they never did, then you'll understand better the buffalo jump of the 1980s. Now, this is referring to a 300 page a uh, policy paper that was written specifically for cabinet. It was never supposed to be released. However, we got it through, um, uh, an employee had actually leaked it and so it became a public document. But it was a memorandum, secret memorandum to cabinet that said, here's how we're going to implement our original vision. And it's very telling that they were, they were essentially saying, we're going to do the exact same things. So they were talking about, first of all, in terms of you know, the conversation we have with the public, we have to start turning this problem back on itself. So instead of it being the government's not abiding by treaty rights or the government's not um, providing enough funding, let's make it First Nations' fault. Um, they're just incompetent. They can't control their own affairs. They spend too much money. You know, they're corrupt uh, leaders. So that not only will the public have some sympathy for the government, but that also helps turn community members against First Nation leaders and cause political discord. The other thing they did, um, their other recommendation was that while we're doing this business, we're also gonna sell any solutions that we want, which will be based primarily on the 1969 white paper, as joint solutions. So by joint solutions, what they meant was, we're gonna try and find individual First Nations or First Nations leaders that can stand beside us and do joint, announce joint announcements and say, you know, this is in your best interest, we have First Nation uh, consent, and try to sell their policy agenda that way. And to, you know, to kind of make it almost impossible for First Nations to have any kind of capacity to identify what they were doing and respond to it, they cut funding. They recommended cutting funding for First Nations governments. So all of their, you know, think of your policy advisors, your researchers, um, all of the technicians that work in any government, legal advisors that help support and run a government. Well, they cut the funding for uh, bans at that time so that they wouldn't have that capacity, while at the same time also contemplating uh, cutting funds for any of their advocacy organizations. So imagine what that would do to your ability to respond to these things coming from very powerful and very wealthy governments. Now, at the same time, because don't forget, they're still trying to find ways to separate our community members from our leaders. Uh, one of the things they did was actually reduce funding for social programs and services. So they reduced funding for housing on reserve to specifically act as a disincentive for people to stay living on reserve because they figured that if they could geographically separate community members from their nations, then that would weaken the link and that would help towards assimilation. 
Um, and at the same time, they also started to not just reduce funding for health, uh, health services, but they had also recommended that the cabinet include disincentives within health funding mechanisms. Disincentives like just saying no every time someone uh, uh, applies to have some kind of uninsured health benefit paid for, or if they make an appeal, just say no. And it actually got to the point, you know, from the 80s forward, that most appeals for health services were almost 100% rejections. So they did, in fact, actually implement some of these uh, recommendations and it's very it made it very very difficult for First Nations to respond so all of a sudden you don't have you have less money for programs and services and you're trying to uh, negotiate that with your community members and then you have less money for your own government so you can't hire people to help work on these issues meanwhile the government keeps pushing things along so that we can hard it's really hard for us to keep up now while all of this is happening in the 80s, keep in mind what's happening on the legal side of things. So not just the policy front or the political front, but you also have you know, former Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau, whose dream was to repatriate the Constitution and include a Charter of Rights and Freedoms that focused on you know, gender equality and a whole bunch of other things. So this was a, a massive project here in Canada because it would make Canada an independent state from the British, um, from the British monarchy. And what ended up happening was First Nations uh, demanded to be at the table. Uh, they refused to have any kind of support unless they got provisions like Section 35 uh, enacted into the Constitution. Now, Section 35, lots of you might already know, but this is the section in Canada's Constitution Act that actually protects Aboriginal and treaty rights for Aboriginal peoples, being defined as Indian, Inuit, and Métis, Indian being uh, First Nations. And they also guaranteed those rights equally between male and female First Nations people. But here's the thing, the big thing that most First Nations who were trying to negotiate Section 35 wanted in the Constitution was a recognition of First Nations sovereignty and jurisdiction and our form of government. Now, there was different ideas about what that government would be. Would it be a third order of government, like another head of power in the Constitution? Or would it be a constitutional recognition that we have these powers, but outside of the Constitution? But it didn't matter what ideas were brought forward or what wording was brought forward. During the um, constitutional talks and the meetings with the prime ministers in the provinces, every single option, every single draft or amendment that was put before them to please recognize First Nation uh, sovereignty and jurisdiction in a way that's actually uh, legally and politically um, similar to what our ideas are, they just rejected it outright. So we have a constitution now that recognizes specifically Aboriginal and treaty rights, but not specifically First Nations jurisdiction and governance. Now, after the Constitution, uh, the next question was, how are the courts going to interpret all of this? So we're dealing with the federal government on a policy level, we're dealing with them on a constitutional level, and then it's like, what are the courts going to do? And in the very beginning, like literally the very first court case, the Sparrow case that dealt with Section 35, although it had lots of problems, uh, which shouldn't be a surprise because it's Canada's laws and Canada's courts, we know that they're going to be very much biased in favor of Canadian positions, um, but in terms of how they interpreted Section 35 and the right to fish, because that's what the Sparrow case was about, they said very specifically that because the Indigenous right to fish, the First Nation right to fish, was constitutionally protected, that that means it trumps all other rights. And they said very particularly that Trumping all other rights means, let's just pretend there's only 10 fish in the ocean. And First Nations need five fish to feed themselves, and the other five need to be set aside for conservation so that we always have those fish. That means that no one else gets to fish. 
No commercial fishery, no sports fishery, no leisure fishery, nothing. That's how strong the First Nation constitutional rights were because, and, and that makes sense, think about it just from a, a layperson's perspective. If you have a constitutional right to fish, but no, nobody else does or no other group or organization does, of course that one's going to get priority. But that priority from that first case started to be whittled very quickly until you get to the Delgamuk case, where, okay, now we're talking about land. And the courts and the governments and their interventions made, made it very clear that when we're talking about land, even though it's constitutionally protected, they still allow a whole bunch of things to trump our constitutional rights from things like historical use, uh, like commercial fishers, for example, uh, mining, hydroelectric, hydroelectric development, forestry, and even, get this, the settlement of foreign populations. As if First Nations haven't already lost enough from uh, settlement, they're saying that, in fact, settlement of foreign populations will be a justification for interfering with our Aboriginal title rights. And so the courts and their interpretation of Section 35 hasn't been very helpful. And so if you think about First Nations, they have now dealt with all of this. You know, we don't just deal with one official at the Crown. We're literally dealing with it on a policy basis, a legal basis, constitutional basis, and we're in courts, increasing uh, numbers. So while all of this is unraveling, then you have another push, like literally a surprise push by the federal government, the Minister of Indian Affairs, Bob Nolt. Um, and he was the Minister of Indian Affairs when uh, Jean Chrétien had actually been elected to Prime Minister. So Jean Chrétien is still in there. And their idea is, well, let's just do this massive amendment to the Indian Act and call it the First Nations Governance Act, where we will get all of the provisions that we want in there, more controls, more oversight, more power for the federal government, um, and we'll just go ahead and implement this. Well, of course, as soon as First Nations found out what was actually going to be in the legislation, the vast majority protested because they wanted things like more accountable First Nations. And I mean, First Nations were already accountable to the federal government. You, you couldn't be any more accountable. But what they're talking about when they're saying accountability is we want more information about your own businesses, your own own source revenue, and we, we want all of your business secrets and things like that to really put us at a disadvantage. Now, the other thing they wanted to do was to make the Canadian Human Rights Act applicable to First Nations governments. And they didn't want that for good reasons. They wanted that to create a scenario where individual First Nations citizens would stop suing the federal government for all of the discrimination that's in the Indian Act and in the treaty violations and things like that by making individual community members actually focus on their First Nation leaders. So if the Canadian Human Rights Act applied to First Nation leaders and you didn't get a house because there's not enough funding for housing, the community member sues the person that they can reach out and touch, which is their chief and council, and doesn't sue the federal government. So that actually takes up a lot of time, energy, and resources where First Nations are just literally filing tons and tons of complaints against their leaders, and the federal government gets to stand back and try to push things forward. The other thing they wanted to do with this legislation is create new financial rules uh, where you had to do even more reporting and get access to, uh, remember I was talking about the own source revenue, but they were trying to incorporate that into law. Now, First Nations all across the country, like I said, protested against that and they said, no way, we're not going to do it. So then they had to kind of step back and say, okay, 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 we're not going to go ahead with the First Nations Governance Act. But if you actually look at my slides, you'll see that I've actually highlighted some things in red, some of the core things that the federal government wanted out of the First Nations Governance Act. And if you compare those things with the federal legislation uh, that has come out over the last 10 or 15 years, I've also highlighted in red some of those acts that gave the, the federal government exactly what they wanted in the First Nations Governance Act, but they didn't get as a package. So they used the 1969 white paper um, strategy where instead of trying to promote it as one big package, 
they'll just separate it into tiny little pieces of legislation so First Nations won't know what's going on or won't have the opportunity to resist it in the same way. So they have essentially both um, uh, conservative and liberal federal governments have enacted all of this list of legislation on my slide and got their financial um, accountability, got their Canadian uh, Human Rights Act, got all of the things that they were looking for. And so if you, I mean, that's a really important thing to notice, that there's this pattern, this is trend that always happens with the federal government. You've got, you know, here's the big package, our idea of what's good for you, which is never good for us. And when that meets with resistance, naturally, then they break it up into little pieces so that we don't see or we don't have enough resources to defeat what's going on. Now, the other thing that happens, of course, keep in mind, even though this is we're all talking about legislation, is what's happening on the policy front. So not just what they're proposing, but what are they doing behind the scenes that's not directly noticeable? And one of the most debilitating things that they did was to implement a 2% funding cap on all of our social programs and services. And that means funding could increase by more than 2% on an annual basis, despite what the inflation rate was, despite what the needs were, despite what the population increases were, because keep in mind, First Nations uh, had the highest or fastest growing uh, demographics. And it also didn't matter what our treaty or Aboriginal rights were. So that's something else that makes us markedly different from uh, other groups in society, that we have treaty rights that specifically say, you must pay for schools, you must pay for teachers, you must pay for health care, you must do all of this. So it's not just good will of the sovereign kind of programs and services. We're talking about treaty rights, constitutionally protected rights to these uh, programs and services. And that 2% funding cap was really devastating. It had huge social health uh, implications on the community uh, on the ground, but it also caused problems between the leaders and the community members uh, because the community members didn't know that this wasn't coming from the leaders, that it was actually coming from the federal government. The other thing uh, was that they uh, increased their funding cuts to First Nation political and advocacy organizations. So while First Nations have less and less money at the governance uh, level to actually advocate on their own behalf, they couldn't even rely on tribal governments, uh, provincial or regional governments, or national organizations because their funding was also being cut. So this was very strategic and purposeful. Now, at the same time, you know, you've got all of these tables going on. You're talking about there are some First Nations that are engaged in self-government negotiations, but the vast majority of them are very much limited to municipal powers. And then you have uh, take it or leave it specific claim offers. Um, so those negotiations aren't really negotiations if the government says, hey, here's our offer, take it or leave it. But on things like major land claims or comprehensive uh, land claims and negotiations, there was a legal requirement that you had to cede, surrender, and extinguish all of your rights to that territory if they, the government was going to negotiate any kind of self-government or land, uh, land claim agreement with you, which the United Nations uh, has called in its study on treaties an actual form of legal duress, that to actually make that an obligation that you have to extinguish all of your rights puts uh, First Nations in an impossible position. They will never get compensation unless they give up everything else. And that's, um, that's not fair legally, it's not fair morally, but these are the kinds of things as a policy agenda that they were also imposing on First Nations. So imagine this like multi-layered tiered approach uh, just putting incredible pressures on First Nations and it's no wonder that conditions continue to get worse. One of the other things that they did, and I know that a lot of uh, treaty land entitlement First Nations and other First Nations who have been waiting to add lands to reserve for years and years and years, is that the federal government actually slowed up those processes. And so what should only take six months or more to do uh, an actual addition to reserve was taking two years, five years, 10 years, 13 years, even more in some cases. Basically, it's like putting everything on hold so that 
You can hurry up with your other agenda, like assimilation or people moving off the reserve or First Nations just giving up because of the pressure. And the one thing uh, about First Nations and First Nations protection of their sovereignty and jurisdiction is that they have never given up, and I don't think that they ever will. But to know that they were being hit very hard financially uh, really speaks to the kind of challenges that we face going forward. And it helps understand this historical policy and legal and financial context as to where are we now? Because things look great. You know, Canadian society and other people that I go, different universities and public events, people will say, hey Pam, you know, oh, isn't that great? Former Prime Minister Stephen Harper's gone, and oh, thank goodness, you know, the new Prime Minister Trudeau, he just says all the right things, and everything's great. And you know, to his credit, Prime Minister Trudeau has changed the public discourse. Instead of vilifying First Nations or saying that they're rogues or threats to national security like the former government, he does say things like, there is no relationship more important to me and to Canada than the one with Indigenous peoples. And he'll also say things like, uh, our relationship going forward is going to be a renewed nation-to-nation -nation relationship, which is also encouraging. And that all of our relationship going forward will be based on a respect and implementation of all of our rights. Well, that sounds great. And if you look at what the other ministers have said, they've all said they want to combat racism, they want to decolonize their uh, departments, they want to change everything about how they do business. And if you look at all of the, you know, kind of visuals around in the media and, you know, print and TV, it's always Prime Minister Trudeau, you know, taking a selfie with a First Nation person or hugging a First Nation person or getting a gift from a First Nation person. I mean, he even sports a Haida tattoo for Pete's sake. So you have this scenario where it looks good, but is that really what's happening? Is that really what we're getting? Well, you have to analyze that. You can't just engage in political rhetoric. And that's part of the analysis that I'm uh, helping to share with First Nations, is that the first thing I look at is not what they say, because I don't think you can ever trust what a government official says. We learned our lessons with you know, broken promises for treaty rights, and we know that the things that they say historically are not true. Uh, so let's look at the actual facts. And some of the things that we looked to was, well, what about his uh, election platform, for example? And he said lots of really encouraging things. And one of the most encouraging things was that uh, we will have a national inquiry into murder to missing Indigenous women because Stephen Harper wouldn't do that. We will implement all of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action. We will implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which also is an international document which recognizes all our rights. But one of the most important things he said was that we will repeal all of that legislation, remember in those former slides, um, that Harper implemented and imposed on First Nations without our consent. And then the last one, which is probably the most significant and relevant right now, is that when he was pressed and he was asked, what does free prior and informed consent mean to you? Because that's also in the United Nations Declaration. And uh, if First Nations, for example, said no to a pipeline, even if the science said it was safe, uh, would that no mean no under your government? Would it mean, do First Nations have a veto for development on their lands? And he said, and I quote, absolutely. So by all means, his election promises looked like they were going in the right direction, and it's probably why he had so much support at the First Nation level. And then we had to look at the things that he's, he's said since. Now he said, you know, there's no relationship more important than the one with indigenous peoples and we're gonna go on a nation to nation basis. And he was constantly asked, well, how do we know this is the case? And he was always saying, I give you my word. I promise. And we all know how much a government promise is worth. It's worth about as little as uh, an election promise. And here's why, because you can't take it to the bank. You can't go to the courts and say, well, look, he made this promise in the media that he would keep his word. You don't, th those things aren't judiciable. And so then we have to look at, okay, 
Those are his election promises. This is what he said, you know, don't worry, I'm going to implement them once he was elected. So the first thing I looked at were the uh, cabinet mandate letters. So the prime minister issues a letter to each of uh, his cabinet ministers to say, here's what you're going to do to implement all what we promised during the election, you know, as our government package. And when I looked at the mandate letters, you'll see, you know, I uh, did excerpts from different ministerial mandate letters, and they talk more about smaller issues, programs, programs like Nutrition North or skills training or uh, adult training, um, how to include Indigenous perspectives on... Um, the health of our oceans, but you don't see anything in li that list about the return of lands, the return of our natural resources and other resources. You don't see anything about respecting First Nations sovereignty and jurisdiction. So that was my first red flag. My next one was to say, okay, how did these mandate letters translate into ongoing political promises? And for the first time ever, we have a prime minister that is attending multiple uh, chief's assemblies in a row at the Assembly of First Nations. And despite what those mandate letters said, when he spoke to the chiefs, his promises kind of reverted back to what he was talking about before. He said, we're going to repeal all of Harper's legislation. We're going to have this national inquiry. We're going to lift this 2% funding cap. We're going to give immediate money for education. Um, you know, we're going to implement the United Nations Declaration in an unconditional way. So those rights are just going to be transported into Canada. So it sounded really good that maybe uh, he was still going to move ahead with the things that he had promised us. Oh, but unfortunately, you have to look at how do these things manifest into actual directions or legal agreements. So you've got the election promises, and then you look at the mandate letters, and they're woefully inadequate. Then you have all of these promises once elected to the chiefs and assembly, and then you have to look at what's in the actual MOU. And again, very underwhelming. You have an agreement between the Assembly of First Nations and the federal government that says, here's what we agreed to do. Here's what how they interpret nation to nation. First of all, nation to nation is apparently with the Assembly of First Nations, who is not a nation, it's not a right holder, it's just a political organization. And in fact, they wouldn't even be able to go to court and sue for any rights because they as an organization, a corporation, they don't have any rights. Only First Nations do. So that's the big problem. The next problem is look at the fundamental core promise or objective in the MOU. I mean, I had to read it several times just to be sure that that's exactly what it said. But if you look at it, it says the purpose of the MOU is to establish processes, to engage in processes, to establish other processes. Well, if that's not an empty promise, I don't know what is. So basically what they said is that they were going to give AFN millions of dollars to set up a whole bunch of processes, meetings, uh, round tables, research tables, investigatory tables, the same kind of tables that the AFN has had with the federal government for literally decades, and that that's the big bonus for us. My first clue that there was something wrong was that this agreement, of course, was being negotiated in secret, and generally that's not how we do things as First Nations, but the Assembly of First Nations negotiated this in secret with the federal government, and the original draft uh, was leaked to the media. And in the original draft, it had all of these protections for First Nations sovereignty and jurisdiction. But then if you compare that draft with the one that was finally signed, you see there's no mention of sovereignty, there's no mention of jurisdiction, and there's really no protection uh, for our Aboriginal and treaty rights. So as far as the AFN's MOU goes, that's, that's another uh, sign that the federal government and the AFN, in fact, are not going in the right direction. So let's look at exactly what the federal government has done. The federal government has done a complete opposite of what it said it would do. Prime Minister Trudeau and his cabinet minister said, unlike the former Harper government, there would be no more imposing federal initiatives on First Nations. Everything that would be done with consultation and consent of First Nations, that there would be no uh, top-down approach. This isn't going to be, here's what we think is good for you and force you to do it. It was all going to be First Nation-led. Yet, 
everything that the Prime Minister has announced has been a complete surprise to First Nations. The first thing he said was, um, oh, you know, he had these tearful apologies for different things that have happened historically, but then he says, okay, our first initiative is we're going to have a new name. And uh, first of all, nobody was asking him for a new name for Indian Affairs. He, it was Indian Affairs. The Harper government changed it to Aboriginal Affairs, and then they changed it to Indigenous Affairs. We didn't ask for that. We had no input. That's hardly a gift to us uh, in any way. Uh, but it gets worse than that. Then he says, oh, and double surprise, not only are we going to have one Minister of Indian Affairs, now we have two Ministers of Indian Affairs. Again, they did that without consulting with us. It certainly wasn't anything on our list of things that we wanted. And then uh, they announced uh, that there would be 10 principles. Here's the 10 principles for our relationship going forward. And we had no input into that either. It's basically, here's the law that we're laying down and here's how our relationship will go forward. And then finally, they make this announcement about this human rights federal framework. And again, something that we didn't ask for and they didn't give us a whole lot of information. So now we're stuck with two ministers of Indian Affairs, um, but under the law, there's only one real minister of Indian Affairs, and that's Carolyn Bennett. Uh, minister Philpott came from the Department of Health and is now the tag team Indian Affairs. But it gets worse than that, because not only are there two, surprise, the most recent surprise is that we have a third minister of Indian Affairs who's actually going to work with Carolyn Bennett to force this framework through. So we've been saying, get out of First Nations business, get rid of Indian Affairs, and we will take care of our own affairs. Instead, they give us three new ministers of Indian Affairs, and that's going in the exact opposite direction of what we wanted. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these 10 principles, but what I will do is post this PowerPoint in the description box of my YouTube video so that you can refer to it and follow up with it and uh, compare it to what the federal government has said. But these 10 principles, while they use wording that sounds good, it's actually not good at all. And we'll just take one for example. They say that the purpose of Section 35 is reconciliation. Most people will think, well, that's a good thing. That's referring to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, how we have to do things differently with First Nations, how we have to respect their rights and um, be more reflected in universities and the media and all of these things in the calls to action. What they're talking about is legal reconciliation. And legal reconciliation comes from the Supreme Court of Canada, and it's actually not a good thing. It's where the Supreme Court of Canada said that reconciliation under Section 35 means that we take Canada's assertion of sovereignty over our territories and reconcile that with our pre-existing original real sovereignty and when, it's, when you put those two things together, First Nations have to give stuff up. We're the ones that have to compromise. So that's not actually how we see ourselves going forward. We want our sovereignty to be recognized in the same way that Canada's is. And if you go through all of these 10 uh, principles that the federal government drafted, they're all like that. They're either fluff statements or you can't take them to the bank. Now, the other thing um, about some of these things is that you have to look at the very wording of it. So Justice Canada uh, obviously helped draft some of these principles because it was released by the Minister of Justice, Jody Wilson-Raybould, and they talk about things like, we will aim to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as opposed to, we will implement it into law as a right. And when you're talking about law, aiming and will do things are completely different legal scenarios. So we have to be very careful when looking at those 10 principles. Now the other thing is the, the framework itself. So the framework talks about we will protect in federal legislation constitutionally protected rights. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a second, Aboriginal and treaty rights are already protected under the Constitution under Section 35. We all know because of the legal status of the Constitution that it trumps all other federal and provincial laws. No federal law can amend the Constitution. So what are they talking about? How, what kind of recognition can they give to Section 35 rights 
that aren't already in Section 35, unless their intention is actually to define it and limit the scope about what those rights can mean in Canada, and we've come to find out that that's exactly what they mean. The other kinds of issues that we picked out would be um, you know, no, new dispute resolution mechanisms to stop us from going to court to sue Canada to keep our rights upheld. And the other thing is that provinces must be involved in this process. So they've been going across the country talking to First Nations, you know, for the last year or two about this federal framework, but you don't see any provincial representatives there. And it's all well and good for the federal government to say, oh yeah, we recognize your right to cut timber in your territory. However, the provinces are the ones that arrest and charge us and stop us from doing that. So without the provinces at the table, how is this even going to even be able to be implemented? Where did all of this come from? Well, I think it's important to know that where this comes from is Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould herself. Despite the fact that she's Indigenous, this kind of very limited, rights-limited um, framework comes from a piece of legislation that she tried to co um, promote when the former conservative government was there. It basically implements the inherent rights policy approach, which is very limited. Uh, the Harper government never got a chance to get it through, but she instead, when she was the regional chief of the BC Assembly of First Nations, put it into a toolkit. And so all of these ideas, this initiative is really being driven by Minister uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould. And that's why you don't see her uh, very often talking about this federal framework or all of the reasons why First Nations aren't in, um, in favor of it. But you, also, you can't just ignore her either because she is the Attorney General for Canada. And what she says is going to be the legal interpretation of our rights actually has some significant sway. So what did she say about UNDRIP? Well, in, two, uh, in 2016, she said it's completely unworkable in the law. What did she say about free prior and informed consent? Well, she said consent's not a veto. And then what about this legislative framework? Is it really and truly about recognizing First Nations jurisdiction over themselves? And she's like, no, you're just drawing down under federal or provincial uh, jurisdiction. All of the things that we don't want. So it's important to know what Canada's lawyer is saying. The other thing that it's important to look at um, is what is the fine print? So the government is saying this legislation will help rebuild your nations and refocus on your governance and, and capacity building. But if you actually look at what their governance and capacity building is talking about, they're talking about establishing bylaws, or drafting new bylaws, amending bylaws, or recording bylaws under the Indian Act. And we already talked about how little those bylaws are. That's not the kind of governance we're talking about. We're talking about having a say in national security and international trade and what happens with our lands and taxes and all of those things. Not the little tiny powers that they have under the Indian Act. The other thing is they're saying, we promise, don't worry, we're not going to use the seed, surrender, and extinguish language anymore. But what they're not telling you is we're going to do almost the same thing. So basically you'll sign an agreement and it'll say, I promise to never exercise or assert any of my rights over this territory for the rest of our lives or, you know, for the rest of this agreement. But they don't tell you about the little provision that comes after that, that not only are you volunteering to give up your rights, uh, instead of saying seed, surrender, and extinguish, but the provision that comes after that says, oh, and by the way, if a court says that that kind of voluntary uh, extinguishment isn't legal or has no effect, then you will sign this provision that says you seed, surrender, and extinguish your rights. So how is that fundamentally different? And you can go through it all the way through. One of the things that Prime Minister Trudeau tries to do is distance itself from the former Harper government. And remember the former Harper government was trying to implement something called reserve privatization, which would take our collective lands and divide it up into individual parcels and there would be no more reserves anymore. Well, this government is doing the same thing. In fact, it's actually in their departmental plan, if you go through it and actually read it, that they're actually putting money towards uh, pushing this idea of reserve privatization. And how do we know this? Well, not only is it in their departmental plan, 
but scholars have made access to information requests which show millions of dollars went out under the conservative government, millions of dollars are going out under the liberal government, and nothing has changed about the idea. They're still trying to break up our collective land-based rights into reserve privatization so that there won't be any more reserves. And you can go through some of the core things that we found in the uh, access to information request and you should actually put them to the minister and say, well, wait a second, you're actually doing the exact same thing. But what they're doing is they're trying to sell it with new words, that this will be reconciliation, that this will be how we fund the housing problem, that this will be how we recognize First Nation jurisdiction. And it has nothing to do with any of that stuff. And then what about First Nation jurisdiction? How, in fact, do we recognize First Nations jurisdiction and sovereignty, either inside or outside the Constitution? And either way, it's pretty well determined that we'll need some kind of constitutional amendment if we're talking about a First Nation head of power or if we're talking about something like um, a recognition of sovereignty. But Prime Minister Trudeau says, we're not even going there. We're not even talking about constitutional amendments. So if that's the case, then I guess Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould is true what she's saying, that what we're talking about is we will actually be granted authorities or delegations under federal or provincial jurisdictions and not a recognition of our own. So that is essentially treating us like municipalities. So again, we put that question to them. Are you really just trying to enforce municipal status on us? And of course, they said no. The promise was, and I quote, the framework will not create municipal governments. Yet Trudeau, when he's outside of the country talking about what they're intending for us as First Nations, they're saying, well, after the federal government, after the provincial government, and after municipal governments, we're talking about this fourth level of government. So in his own words, that's what he's saying. So we also put that to the minister. Are you or are you not contemplating just giving us weak municipal type rights? And she says, absolutely not. That is not our intention. So fact check. What we do is we compare her speech to exactly what the prime minister said. We look at what the framework proposal uh, contemplates, which is that they would turn us into natural persons. And we're like, natural persons? Where does that come from? So you do an access to information request and you find out, Oh, their own internal secret documents, again, are saying that the idea is analogous to what they do to municipal governments. That they turn municipal governments, um, they use this concept of natural persons where you uh, establish a corporation that can sign their own um, agreements and contracts and funding and things like that, and that that's what we're going to do for First Nations. So in fact, they're again lying to us. It is their intention to turn us into municipal governments. So, very quickly, what are some of the considerations? So knowing that this is all the case, what do we do about that? Well, my first concern is that we're worlds apart. They think that we're a fourth level of government when we consider that we're the first level of government and at least no less than on par with the federal government. But there's more concerns than just that. So aside from the fact that we're nowhere near being anywhere close to uh, like minds of what we're talking about here, um, there's been no uh, offer of compensation for all of the breaches of treaties and the stolen lands and resources. There's no commitment to entrench our sovereignty and jurisdiction either in the Constitution or a recognition of our sovereignty outside of the Constitution. Uh, there's been no substantive commitments to return our lands, return our resources, implement and respect treaties. All of the core issues that we have been advocating for decades doesn't seem to be on the table. And then there's actually no commitments for needs and resource, um, needs and rights-based funding either. We have this massive deficit of underfunding in child and family services and education and housing and water, all the basics of life. And they haven't even come up with a commitment to do that. Their focus though, however, is transferring and empowering crown agencies to have more control over our lives. That's not the deal that we signed up for. And they're saying, well, don't worry, we're thinking about it, making it opt-in legislation. Well, opt-in isn't truly opt-in if it's that or nothing. 
if it's that or the horrendous status quo. And so if you look at, you know, there's, there's like a litany of concerns and we can only go over so many in this short video, but they're trying to speed this through before we have a chance to talk to our community members. There's a lack of transparency. They won't share with us the information that they're getting from third parties so that we know what industry is saying, not that we think industry should have a say. Um, there's no information coming from them about all of their previous promises, like to make sure that all federal laws are Section 35 compliant. We just get nothing, no information. It's a one-sided process that's no different than what Harper has done before. And <clears throat> when you go through this um, PowerPoint after this video, um, you'll see that I've given you lots of examples. I will just give one, but when you're reading their documents, always try to identify Justice Canada weasel words when they say we aim to do something as opposed to we will legislate the right or you must respect provincial jurisdiction as opposed to we will ensure that legally provinces have to respect your jurisdiction. So Justice Canada has a very heavy hand in what's being offered here. Check for their weasel words. And ultimately, when I looked at every other proposal that's ever been done throughout history, from the 1969 white paper forward by uh, conservative and liberal governments, I made a chart and you'll see that they're, they're offering the exact same thing. So this federal legislative initiative is fundamentally no different than Harper's agenda, than the 1980s Buffalo jump, or the 1969 white paper. It's all about transferring jurisdiction to provinces, reserve privatization, and no real movement on lands and treaties. And that's something that you should know before you head to the negotiating table. So the other thing that you'll see in my um, uh, slides is that I've done an update on what's happened. So the chiefs at different uh, AFN chiefs assembly have said, no, we reject this. We want this to come to a halt. It has to stop. AFN hasn't stopped. They're still going ahead despite the direction from the chiefs to stop. And they've had meetings uh, subsequent to that. And there have been official letters and resolutions sent to the Minister of Indian Affairs. And the Minister of Indian Affairs has said, well, you know, we're, we're listening, but we're not stopping the process. So you have a scenario where now the AFN and the federal government are just forcing this down our throats when the majority of First Nations have seemed to say, both on the record and in the media, no, we don't want this. And so we have a really big problem. What is it that we do? Where do we go from here? We have you know, the, the, this government forcing this down our throat, and I think that we need to exercise our right to say no. And we do have a right to say no. Uh, despite what anyone else says, we have a sovereign right to say no, we have a political and legal right to say no, and advance our own solutions. And not just a one-size-fits-all. I think the worst thing that could happen to us is that we have a pan aberration Original legislation that throws all First Nations and Métis groups and Inuit all together who have vastly different rights and then try to come up with some uh, legislative framework that addresses all of them. And all that does is dilute and water down our rights as First Nations. And that's something that's not acceptable. So uh, there's also a list you'll see in my PowerPoint, I've just been going through them, that the chiefs have made some very vocal and public concerns at these meetings. I've summarized them for you. They basically raise all of the same concerns that I have raised in this uh, presentation. But there's one thing I think, uh, there's a few things that I have to bring to your attention before I close here. And one is, you know, the best indication of where the federal government is going to go f on a go forward basis is what they're doing right now. So Trudeau made lots of promises, but what happened with the Trans Mountain Pipeline decision? They didn't consult with First Nations properly, they didn't even consider our Section 35 rights, and they lost at court. And the Federal Court of Appeal said, listen, you didn't even take into account their Section 35 rights, so your approval of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion is uh, null and void and you have to start over. So what was their response? Their response should have been, sorry about that, First Nations, we'll do better next time. Instead it was, I mean, if you look at all these quotes, basically it's, we need this project, it's gonna go ahead anyway. So we know that that's where the federal government is headed. We know that um, uh, Premier Doug Ford is the same way. He's basically saying, who cares what First Nations say about the Ring of Fire? 
If I have to jump on the bulldozer and take out those you know, minerals myself, I will do that. He's even willing to use the Section 33 notwithstanding clause to just ignore any constitutional right. The same thing for Alberta. The same thing for the province. I mean, we're in a scenario where my best advice to you is, if you're a First Nation who opposes this federal legislation, get it on the record, put it in writing, you know, shout it from the rooftops, make sure that people know and your citizens know. Negotiate directly with Canada and the provinces. Don't negotiate through the AFN anymore. They're completely compromised. They're not acting in our best interest. They're not even listening to the resolutions from the chiefs. Uh, put Canada also on official notice that no one speaks for your First Nation or treaty area or nation or collective uh, except for those that you purposely mandate. And a prerequisite to any kind of talk or negotiation is they need to ante up. We need to be able to go out there and consult with our communities. We need the information. We need uh, technical advisors, legal advisors, policy advisors. And in the meantime, Whatever you do, do not let them negotiate one-off agreements where the provinces continue to be the middle person for all of our uh, programs and resources like education, housing, and CFS. They have literally ruined everything. So on a go-forward basis, don't let Canada define or limit your rights in legislation. Don't let them do a pan-Aboriginal approach. It simply doesn't work. And remember, we're the ones who decide if we want to do it on a First Nation by First Nation basis, on a nation basis, on a treaty area basis. That's up to us, and we need to assert and defend that. And don't let them rush you into abolishing the Indian Act. They would only want you to do that so that all, all of, there would be this legislative void and the provinces would have control over everything. And I think the other key issue is when we're talking on uh, negotiation, um, Resource sharing, we're not just talking about natural resources, and in some facts, natural resources might be something we want to protect. We're talking about taxes, fees, fines, um, all of the things that are collected on our territories. So remember, everything that our First Nations governments are about is protecting our jurisdiction, the return of lands and resources, protecting our treaties, and, and protecting our people. So when they say, listen, We'll listen, but we're not going to stop the process. The only people that can stop this process are us, because we've stopped every other process. We stopped the 1969 White Paper, we stopped the First Nations Governance Act, and we've stopped many other things. We have the power to do that. We just have to rise up and do it. And, you know, I will leave you with this parting thought about the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. It's true, they did say we could implement our own sovereignty and self-determination by negotiating with Canada and the provinces. But where that's not possible, then we have the legal authority and inherent right to exercise those powers outside of those agreements. We can just do it on the strength of our sovereignty. And here's the thing about sovereignty. We have to live it, we have to assert it, and we have to defend it. So no matter what happens from this point on, whether we're successful, whether we're not successful, what the government tries to do or doesn't try to do, never stop asserting your sovereignty, and act your own laws, enforce your own laws, and go ahead and do what we need to do, because they are never going to do it for us. And in case you have any questions, um, after I post the uh, PowerPoint online, you can contact me at any of these social media outlets. Please share this with your friends, your neighbors, your allies. Please uh, like the video, share the video, give me comments, give me questions, and I can do follow-ups on this. Thank you for joining me.